Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, Thursday after Thursday evening uh, morning to Guido uh, on our Python day, and we'll start off with an interview with uh, Guido van Rossum. And well, what better way to start a Python evening uh, than to interview arguably the most professional uh, Monty Python enthusiast in the world? Um, and well, asking from one Dutch person to another, like, how do you pronounce your name? Oh, uh, well, in Dutch, obviously Guido. Uh, I think in Belgium, it would be Guido. In America, I usually say Guido. That's for people who sort of remember the New Jersey Guidos. Uh, or Guido for people who are uh, Spanish or French in their language background. So whatever whatever you want to say. I, I listen to anything that has the E and the O uh, vowels in it. In it. So if someone in a crowd calls, hey, Pipo, <laughs> then I'll probably uh, turn to look up my name. Yeah, recognizable. That's good to know. <laughs> so we want to start with a little bit of early history. Um, uh, Python, the language, is uh, based originally on APC, language developed CWI here in Amsterdam. Um, and ABC was aimed at non-professional programmers and especially designed for ease of use. Was ease of use also an explicit goal for Python or a leftover trait from ABC? Oh, that's a good one. I, th I think it, it was, I mean, well, nobody intentionally designs a language to be hard to use. So I would say that, that ease of use was, was very important. Uh, my interest in languages from, from the sort of usability perspective definitely came from the ABC background. Uh, that, and I've, I've sometimes said that the fact that Python is also easy to learn, even for people with no programming background, that that was sort of a side benefit that came from ABC that I didn't aim for, because my original target audience was definitely pro professional programmers. Okay. And, um, Do you and think that ease of use has influenced the prevalence of Python in academia specifically, and then especially uh, the use of Python in data science? Oh, that's, that's certain. I think the people who introduced Python in that field, the, the scientists who sort of heard about these and and thought, oh, that's a cool language that we could use to help our scientists write their scripts better. Uh, we're very conscious of the ease of use and, and sort of the ease of learning and the ease of use together. They're, they're not exactly the same property, but they often go hand in hand. No, that's so true. That, that, that has definitely made a big difference. Okay. And now a bit more recently, um, up until July 2018, you served the Python community as a benevolent dictator for life, which I find an amazing title. Um, since then, you have stepped down uh, from that position, which led to the new governance model, um, namely the steering council. And um, Python 3.8 is the first version released under this new governance model, but mm -hmm. you still were part of this uh, steering council. And how's this experience been different than serving as a BDFL, both for you and for Python? It's, it's been much less stressful because I'm not the, the person with the, the final responsibility for everything. That's sort of, in, in, in the years that I was, was BDFL. I mean, I sort of wrote the code, I tested the code. I reviewed contributions. Mm -hmm. I managed the source control system such as it was. Uh, I was the mailing list manager. Uh, the first time that I remember delegating anything was around 94 when 
people said we, or maybe it was 93 people. Anyway, people wanted a Usenet news group. And that was something that was sort of fancier than a mailing list and more convenient. And, and it would take the administrative efforts away from me. And so I said, sure, but I don't know how to do this. You all just do this. You are <coughs> Usenet enthusiasts. Make it happen. Experience delegating. anything to the community uh, but and slowly of course I delegated many other tasks uh, middle list moderator uh, tool author all those things have been taken up by other people <coughs> but when it came to sort of deciding which new features whether with It was to be considered a bug or a feature, whether it was safe to backport the fix, a whole bunch of things, it's deciding on backwards compatibility policy. And you'd be amazed at how many different policies exist for a large popular open source project like this. Like how does someone become a core developer? Uh, who gets the right to triage bugs in the bug tracker? Which bug tracker do we use? Uh, do we extend the language to support a certain concept or activity better? Uh, do we need a multi-line lambda? Everything was my response. I've, I, I suffered from pretty severe burnout, I think, leading up to my rest. Oh, that does, that does and then, then there was a little with, with, with uh, uh, where social media just, just got very nasty. And I, I can handle anonymous trolls on social media just fine. What I cannot handle is when core devs who I thought uh, respected me uh, start disrespecting me with nasty tweets. Uh, and so that, that, that was, and it was very, very good to put all those things behind and sort of let the core developers come to, to an understanding of, well, we, we have to figure out for ourselves what governance model we want. Uh, I joined the steering council, or at least I nominated myself to be elected into the steering council after like five months or so of debate on what kind of, what form of government we should have. Finally, when it was decided to elect a steering council with five people on it, I, I, I believe fairly last minute uh, decided that it would be okay if I nominated myself. Uh, and so I, I served for a year on that steering council as one of the five people making these final decisions and sort of, it was an exercise in delegation because the steering council sort of by design it's written into the PEP. Uh, while it has the same powers as the BDFL had in the past, there is a specific sort of recommendation that the steering council use its powers to the least extent possible. So the steering council should not act as a five-headed dictatorship and randomly say, we got to do this, we got to do that. The steering council should mostly be ratifying what appears to be the consensus or at least the rough consensus of the core dev team as a whole. Uh, and the steering council should also sort of listen to outside voices. For example, the data science world is very important for Python's future, but there are no core developers from that world. So one of the responsibilities of the, the steering council is to, to actually listen uh, to the needs of, of, of data science in Python. 
And I've totally lost track of the question if it was about how I how I feel now. I know I'm no longer BDFL or whatever. But I, I can go on about this topic forever, but maybe you have a follow up question or something else. Like uh, I think that was a lengthy and very on point answer. Um, um, so you mentioned that you nominated yourself for the steering council uh, previously. Was it a conscious decision beforehand to only be on the steering council for one year, or? Could you maybe elaborate on why you have not uh, decided to uh, nominate yourself again? I'm I'm usually not very good at making at sort of having long term prediction of the future. Uh, so honestly, I do not recall whether I sort of meant to serve for only one year or whether I I had any opinion on that. I think that. I know that one of the reasons I figured I should be a member or I wanted to be a member of the the first steering council was definitely to provide some amount of continuity because one of my roles traditionally has also been to to be sort of the the long term memory to to sort of remember how things were done in the past why pieces of code were there, uh, who was involved in which project, and I thought it would be useful for the steering council to uh, to sort of have have my advice in, in that sense. And of course, I could have done that without being a member, but yeah, but after five or six months had, had passed, I was also my burnout was a little less. And so I was, was more willing to, to participate. And then after a year, it was, was actually not at all clear. First, I thought I will not nominate myself for a second term. Then people asked me, will you run? Please run. And so I said, well, okay, if you want to nominate me, nominate me. And so briefly I was nominated and then I realized, well, actually, I, I feel another period of burnout coming on. Uh, and we, we see good candidates besides the, the sitting members. Uh, and I want to give sort of more candidates a chance to actually uh, serve on the council. And so then I withdrew my nomination just before the election started. Okay. Understood. And that, that definitely, that, that was the right, turned out to be the right decision. Um, I'm glad to hear that, especially given that you have dealt with uh, burnouts in the past. I'm no stranger to it myself. Um, in the lead up towards the um, steering council, uh, of course, there was a very high uh, bus factor with you as a BDFL. Um, I can assume that that uh, also contributed to it. And you know, I never know what people mean when they say bus factor. That that's a term from from hardware design that I sort of remember hearing in the seventies or eighties, but mm -hmm. but have actually forgotten what it means. And, and sometimes I think it's a jocular reference to the question, what if Guido were hit by a bus? But, so I, I don't actually know what it means. So can you translate that for me first? That's, that's exactly what it means. It's taken into consideration that a huge, you were a hu or are uh, as a BDFL, a huge part of the project. If you were to suddenly not be able to participate or act as a BDFL, what would happen and what impact would that have on the project of Python? Um, so I guess the question is, was there ever any talk of alternative forms of governance, for example, in the form of a steering council, uh, to take that responsibility a little bit away from just you and divide it over multiple people? That's a good question. And I do not recall there being any serious discussions about a different form of governance or leadership or however you want to, to mention it. It's always actually been, I mean, BDFL was just like a joke title. It wasn't really a defined role or anything. There were some mentions of this 
such a thing needs to be approved by the BDFL, but that was just a shorthand for by Guido van Rossum. <coughs> and so I do remember, but only in the, the last few years before my resignation, that some people started talking about sort of project continuity, uh, which apparently was, was a thing that some other open source projects had, had sort of seriously considered. Uh, my own feelings about that had always been, well, uh, there's a whole community of core devs and there are a number of people who, who can be sort of considered as lieutenants, although we, we've never sort of explicitly named them and we still don't. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, there are very capable people who have been in this community for a very long time. And I totally trust them to sort of continue Python in totally in the spirit of of how, how, how I've always been, been treating it. That's and the steering, yeah, the steering council is, is sort of a version of that. But I was never really, really worried about Python's future if I were to, to suddenly have to leave because there, there were just enough people who who knew exactly what I would say and what I would do. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, so a little bit more about, well, Python history, but a little bit later than we were just talking about. Uh, Python 3 was released in 2008 and Python 2.7 was released in July uh, 2010. That's both quite a long time ago. However, Python 2.7 was only deprecated uh, last January and was still widely used for a long time after 3.0 was released. Can you give us some insight as to why the adoption of Python 3 took so long? That is a topic that can easily fill the remainder of an hour. Uh, <coughs> I've, I've given a talk about that at uh, PyCascades uh, uh, conference a few years ago. I believe that one of the, the big things that happened was that the core team was not actually aware of how successful and Python was by then. Uh, and we didn't realize that a large number of Python users and a large amount of Python code was written by people who sort of produced code and then moved on rather than sort of caring about that code and sort of continually updating it and keeping it up to date. So where we ourselves thought nothing of taking a module and sort of seeing, oh, this uses an antiquated API, let's change all uses of Haskey with uh, the new in operator or something like that. There were a large number of people who didn't care about their code that way, uh, probably didn't have the programming skills and, and the experience to, to sort of effectively implement conversions like that and sort of just generally weren't, weren't as interested in, in Python and Python code as, as, as sort of the, the core team was. But nevertheless, all those people had large and important code bases that did something important in their group or organization or company. And so like half a year ago or so, I got together with a bunch of folks in London one of whom has run a small Python consulting company forever. And so he, he told stories about customers where the typical way his company sort of made money was 
they were approached by a customer who had a problem that they could solve for them. They wrote a bunch of custom code, installed it on uh, a piece of hardware, and then moved on. And maybe they had a, a small contract to keep the hardware up and running, but the customer wouldn't necessarily want to pay to upgrade that code to a new version of Python if they didn't have a need to mm -hmm. have that, that code sort of do something new. And most of these customers are barely aware or not all that interested in sort of the issue of security vulnerabilities. Well, considering uh, yeah, maintaining and upgrading your code, uh, quite recently, or well, in 3.9, a new parser for C Python is being introduced, uh, which you have uh, worked on and written on quite extensively. This is quite a big change. And uh, yeah, my first question would be like, why now? Why is this the time to upgrade the parser? Well, <clears throat> It's debatable whether it's a big change. Of course, in 3.9, the old parser is still around and accepts exactly the same syntax as the new parser. Well, there's one difference, but I'll, I'll leave it for people to find out on their own what that difference is. Uh, so there's a little <laughs> Easter egg there. A little homework. You know, how you read the grammar, you can find it probably. But, but anyway, yeah, why, why now? Uh, because the old parser was 30 years old and could not actually parse certain constructs in the language. The oldest of those was probably keyword uh, arguments in function calls. And if you look at the old grammar, the, the grammar for keyword arguments is literally expression equals expression. And then there is a separate semantic pass that sort of sits between the parser and the code generator that says, well, if we see an argument of the form expression equals expression, then we go check the, the first of those expressions to see that it is actually just a simple name. And I believe until up through 3.6 or 3.7, there was a bug in that code that made it so that if you put parentheses around the keyword on the left-hand side of the equal sign, it would still work because that second, that second check sort of checked the shape of the abstract syntax tree. And in the abstract syntax tree, there is, the parentheses are all implicit. Okay. So the, the, the whole sort of, there were various smaller and larger issues with the, the old parser as, as sort of a tool chain. And that will allow us to, to sort of add new grammar to the language more easily. And I have, I have something in the works for 3.10 that I'm not ready to reveal yet. <laughs> Oh, exciting. Uh, we'll definitely keep an eye out, on, out for that. And uh, um, Well, you mentioned, like, I called it quite a big change. Uh, how much effort does such a change take? And also, you've been working on this with uh, Pablo, who was interviewed uh, this afternoon. Um, how did that process go? Uh, well, I should say that, that actually the third collaborator on the project was Lisandros, uh, mm -hmm. a Greek computer science student uh, at the University of Berlin. Uh, it, it was definitely a big project. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had a few moments where the three of us were sprinting to the almost to the point of breaking because we we had sort of we had a deadline to make the the first deadline i remember wanting to make is getting the pep 
in front of of core devs at the language summit. Uh, and the next that and so we worked really hard to have something working at that point. Plus we we worked on a presentation. Uh, but we at, at that point we we basically had solved the basic problem and we had a working parser and we were already just sort of tweaking compatibility with the old parser and figuring out ways of measuring how compatible it really was with the old parser. Uh, then the next deadline came very quickly after that, a week after the language summit, the steering council actually approved our PEP. Uh, and then we had about one week to get the PEP, to, to get the implementation ready to uh, be put in uh, in the the last alpha release, or it was no, it was not the last. I was, I think it was alpha five that we wanted to get it into, and after that there would be alpha six, and then beta one, and so on. Beta one would have been absolutely last one, but it would have been pretty bad to take such a big refactoring and shove it into the first beta, and then uh, let the beta users uh, test it out. So. I remember leading up to alpha five, we suddenly realized that where we thought we were very compatible, uh, we had not been testing, running the tests in the right way and uh, all sorts of corner cases for which there were explicit unit tests uh, in the, the standard test suite for Python uh, weren't covered. And so then we really had to work our asses off. And we, we ended up asking the release manager for a two-day extension so that we could get last issue resolved. And that, that was a pretty stressful uh, weekend, to be honest. I can imagine. I can imagine. But after that, it, it, things, things went relatively smoothly. And I'm very happy with uh, the overall outcome. It went exactly as I, I hoped it would. That's good. That's good. Um, then, as a little bit of a closing note, before we can take maybe one question from the audience, uh, contributor diversity is important to you and to us. Each year, we award a number of diversity scholarships to people who might not otherwise be able to attend the conference to hope that it remains accessible. Would you like to say something to the people at the conference this year, at this PyData Festival in the attendee list, uh, who received the diversity scholarship? Hi, that, that's, that's like... It's a bit of a broad come, question. <laughs> people come from such diverse backgrounds. Uh, I'm not sure what to say. I'm, I'm, that would be terrible as a commencement uh, or motivational speaker, that's for sure. Uh, I welcome everyone in, in the community. I, I hope that their attending the conference will will sort of get them more involved in the community. I hope that the community is is on its best behavior, uh, and I hope that that we will have a more diverse community membership as a result of of these kind of sponsors sponsorships. Or well, thank yeah. you. Um, we have about one minute left, so that's not that much. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so, uh, let's see which one has okay. the most. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, um, there's exactly that, one question with one upvote. Um, yeah, there's exactly <laughs> one. Um, Dennis asks, oh, there are more, of course. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let's so we knew that the, the votes would matter, right? Yeah, we asked people. Oh, every every question is up <laughs> right now. That that makes it a lot easier to choose. Okay, so we're going to ju we're just going to uh, um, ask the anonymous question. A while back, someone says that an anonymous person says uh, a while back. I remember seeing an exchange between uh, Hido and David Beasley, in which David stated the feeling of Python and the community has changed for him over time. 
Hiro mentioned the influence of data science, which always left me wondering what he meant. Could you maybe shine some light on this, Hiro? Purely out of interest. Okay, well, now you, you have to realize what, what this anonymous attendee uh, doesn't mention is that the whole exchange happened on Twitter. Honestly, I usually don't mm -hmm. understand what Dave Beasley is tweeting about. Uh, and I usually only hear about something he tweets when, when someone sort of says, Guido, you should look at, it, at this because I, I cannot keep up with my main Twitter stream. So I basically, Twitter is, is permanently open just on people who tag me. <coughs> uh, what I mentioned about the influence of data science, uh, data science has brought a large and rather different from the original group of uh, Python users into the community. <clears throat> uh, before data science was a thing, I would expect that the majority of Python users, if, if they weren't like educational enthusiasts, which was mostly a, a small group, they were serious programmers who wanted a good scripting language. Uh, and there was, there was sort of, Python was lumped in the same corner as PHP and Perl and uh, me, even Tickle TK. And uh, serious Python users were probably doing web development. That for, for a long time from the late 90s to uh, the mid aughts web development was one of Python's uh, killer apps. And then just like scripting and tooling, mm -hmm. uh, I, I joined Google at a time where Google was not using Python for web development. I doubt that they actually ever had, but it was the major language for writing tools uh, that stayed inside the company. So. And, and, and Google is very good at tooling, I should say. I don't know if they still write all their tools in uh, Python, but I'm sure that there still is an enormous amount of Python at Google. Uh, and so data science somehow became prominent as a separate activity and somehow some early data science users adopted Python and started writing libraries for Python. And that brought in a whole different crowd of users who often were not professional programmers, but maybe professional statisticians mm -hmm. or professional just researchers. I mean, the number of, of people who have written a PhD using Python code for, for their data handling must be enormous. And that, that sort of, it's just a different, different type of users. And I, I remember sort of attending an early Pi data uh, conference. I think it was in a, a small meeting room at Google actually. Uh, and the, the, the talks, the, the people were different. But one thing was that there was actually, there were more suits and there, was more, there were more people who were thinking seriously about business. And then really that's, that's all I have to say about that particular exchange. All right. Well, uh, then I think that's a good point to end. Um, well, my personal PyData experience is not with a lot of suits, but uh, that's uh, maybe a topic for another time. Um, well, Guido, we would like to uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, for your insights.